Hi, I'm Mark Madison at the National Conservation Training Center in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. And today we have a different type of broadcast as part of our Conservation in Action series. We, we have two visitors here. We have Jim Clark, who used to work at NCTC for a number of years in our training division and now is a contributing editor for Outdoor Photographer magazine. And the real star of today's broadcast is Carson Clark, a uh, recently published author and uh, prize-winning photographer, all of this at the uh, age of fourth grader. So we're, we're very excited to have Carson and Jim here. And uh, Carson actually uh, gave a talk out here last week promoting his new book uh, called Buddy the Beaver. Do I have the title correct, yes. Carson? And uh, as we punch up the, the picture of the book, why don't you tell us a little about Buddy the Beaver? Okay. Well, Buddy is a little beaver that decides that he's going to go explore his pond today. So he goes out exploring. So first he goes to his mother and tells him, tells her that she's, he's going to go on an adventure. So she says, all right, Buddy, you can go. But first go stop by your, the apple tree and go grab a, some breakfast. So after he eats, he'll go... <coughs> and meet, meet up with his old friends and find some new friends for him, such as one of his new friends is Don the Fawn, and some of his old friends, my favorite ones, are Quick, Quack, Quiz, Quackers, and Quillo the Mallards. And uh, it's a very fun book, and it's yes. a, a kid's book. Uh, who took all the photographs in the book? Well, it was 50-50. My dad took 21, and I took 21. That sounds like a good division of the mm -hmm. labor. And uh, how did you begin uh, photography? Well, I started with just little toy cameras, and then my dad started me out with uh, on a little cool Pix Nikon camera, which at first I took pictures of my toes. I don't really know why. <laughs> <laughs> but as... That as might have been the most my... interesting subject at that yeah. age. <laughs> But I played around with it a lot. So then one day I wanted to go go out on a photo shoot with my dad, to be like him. So I took my little uh, my little nature bag with me, dressed up as, as a naturalist, with my little Coolpix camera and went out photographing. And that day I got a picture of a, a monarch butterfly in flight. My dad entered it in the nature's best contest, and it. And it got a highly honored award, and I was the youngest winner ever in the whole contest. And how old were you back then, Carson? I was age six. That's great. Let's look at some of your photographs, because okay. it's, it's nothing more frustrating than to talk about pictures but not actually see them. And I think this first one we're going to punch up um, looks like Buddy the Beaver himself. Why don't you tell us a little about this well, photograph? This is probably going to be in the second book. It's when Buddy goes over to either tell his mom or dad about his great day and how he met so many new friends and learned about hibernation and migration. And where did you take this photograph? Um, the actual location is secret because we don't okay. want anybody else to come, <laughs> but it's down in southern West Virginia. All right. Well, that's that's secret enough. Let's look at a couple more photographs. And, and Carson, virtually all the photographs we're going to show were shot by you, and maybe you can give us a little background on what we're looking at and how okay. you got some of these shots. So we'll punch up uh, another picture in just a second here. Another picture. Um, this one was one of the first shots I took of Buddy. This was him with one of his apples, and where we get the apple part of the story is our what who we call Mr. Uh, beaver man, his name is his name is Mr. Quintofile Johnny. He feeds the beaver beavers these little apples that he grows in his backyard, and that's what attracts them out. And so every evening is when they usually pop up and start eating their apples. Is when we take the photographs. I like that. Is this the secret location? Uh no. <laughs> okay. But we but this is where. Uh, this is actually a beaver, another beaver pond, where we suppose a group of beavers live. 
but we just decided to take a scenic shot of the uh, of beaver habitat, just to tell to just to show people like what it would look like. How are you taking these shots, Carson? Do you have a tripod and everything? Yes, I have a tripod. It, it's a Manfrotto tripod, and I I got a new piece of equipment from from my dad that he bought for me, and it's very good because now when if I take shots of beavers like in one spot and there's and I finish taking photos of them, then on the, if there's some some beavers over there, I can just quickly turn it and take some photographs of them. It's a <clears throat> it's a Wimberley head tripod head, so he can now use the bigger lenses where he used smaller lenses. He can like use a 600 millimeter or 200 to 400 millimeter easily, oh, and great. his his photography this year has improved by. 100% because of just that one piece of, of equipment. So, I mean, one of the things that, that occurs to me as we're talking about this and looking at these beautiful photographs is, you know, one of our pushes now in Fish and Wildlife Service is to get children into nature. And obviously nature photography is a great way to do it. But how did you decide, Jim and, and Carson, what type of equipment to use and when to introduce it? I mean, it's do you have any advice for well, parents that might want to pursue this? <laughs> well, it was easy for me because I've been shooting Nikon most of my career. Okay. It's very, de very dependable equipment, and and it was actually hand-me-down, a little point-and-shoot that he used, and from there he went on to an, another model, and within a year he was shooting with a professional model, Nikon D80, and getting great photographs to where now he shoots with a uh, uh, Nikon D90. D90. Okay. And using all the equipment, he says it's our equipment now, so we share in all the equipment. <laughs> well, that's good. And so, the, the easy thing about this whole story about what happened with Carson is that we just made it fun for him. I didn't teach him anything about exposure or apertures. I said, first go out and just have fun and take pictures. And then each time we were out there, I'd say, now Carson, make sure you think about this when you compose the picture. Mm -hmm. And he got so good at it that the National Wildlife Refuge Association. Uh, invited me to be one of the judges for their annual photography contest and Carson is an honorary judge so he That's actually great. helps judge those images. He'll sit there by the compu computer screen and he'll say, Dad, I don't think this one's composed quite right and we make a vote and decide whether the picture's in or out. Oh, so great. it's been a fun exercise and now he's understanding a little bit more about white balance and exposure but the bottom line is it gets him out to enjoy nature, right. it helps develop this sense of patience, this sense of creativity that I think the younger generation's losing. Uh, you definitely need a lot of patience, don't you, Carson? Uh, you yes. For most animals, like snails or these little creatures called pikas, that are related to the rabbit family, but a lot of friends, they say they look like ma mice. Mm -hmm. um, they take a lot of patience because the snails take a long they're, they're very slow, and sometimes they're kind of scared of humans so they won't come out of the cell. And as for pikas, you have to wait for the, the right moment to get them, and they're so fast yeah. that, that you have to be there at the right moment to get the shot. I want to look at some more of your photographs now, but your, your dad, and, and you'd mentioned composition. What, for those of us who aren't photographers, what do you mean by composition? How are you trying to, to frame up? A photograph. Um. Well, you have to find the right place, the right place to do it at the right time. Mm -hmm. Probably midday would be the worst time to do it because um, the picture would be overexposed, which means too much light. So the best time would be in early morning or late evening or so, sometime that. What about? You're looking out at a pond and it's huge, right? You've got a 360 yeah. degree view of it. How do you decide where to, to aim the camera and where to shoot it? That's something um, that's perplexed me as a, a very well, bad photographer. Well, if, <laughs> if it's a scenic shot, then you should go to probably one of the ends of the lake. So, you, so if you have like a very big camera, you can zoom out all the way, mm -hmm. probably get a very good scenic shot of the whole lake. Or if you just want to take one just certain picture of the lake, you can go anywhere around the lake and take a picture. Great. Let's look at some more photographs and, and see what you get. Here's some more beaver. Where'd you get this shot? Um, this was taken in Yellowstone National Park. It was
was my first year that I went there. My family and I saw these see, saw these two bull elk sitting out in a field. And at that time, elk was my favorite animal, so I just had to go out there and photograph them. What's your favorite animal now? A uh, wolf. I'm trying to get a picture of those, but I've never really found them yet. <laughs> Give yourself time. You're only yeah. a fourth grader. We still have a few years ahead of you. What are we looking at here, Carson? Um, this is at Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge. These are. This was at early night, early evening when my dad and I were out doing the last, the last thing of our photo shoot with my new Nikon D90. My dad told me that. This would be a very nice picture of geese, so called, <laughs> flying over the moon. But, but we just wait for the right moment and then we snap the shots because it kind of looks like that they're actually flying over the moon. Yeah, that's a gorgeous shot. And, and Blackwater, for those of you who aren't from this part of the country, is, is where mm -hmm. is that located, Carson? Um, that's located close to Syncatique. Yep, just eastern shore of Maryland there. Beautiful. Canada Geese <coughs> Refuge initially, and then mm -hmm. you captured their iconic species. Well, you might add that, th that this picture and the previous picture were both finalists in the uh, BBC uh, Viola Wildlife Photographer of the Year Award this year in London, England. And he, Which is he one won, of the most prestigious awards out yeah, there, right? He's had 20 images make the semifinal, final round there with one making it in the last two years, so we're pretty proud of that. Do you guys shoot a lot on refuges, considering your background? Yeah, <laughs> refuges and national parks. But what's one of your favorite national wildlife refuges? We go every year. Um, every Thanksgiving. Oh, right. It would be Cinquantique National Wildlife Refuge on Assateague Island. And the reason that we always go there is for Thanksgiving, but it's for the migration of the snow geese. Yeah. But last year we couldn't get any of the pictures of them because there had been a big flooding there, so and it wiped, and it just took control of all, took control of all the migration and what would happen. One of the hazards of being a photographer, yeah. a wildlife photographer, <laughs> you're depending on the birds. But mm -hmm. I agree with you. Chincoteague is definitely <coughs> one of our most photogenic uh, wildlife refuges. Mm -hmm. You have to get the swimming ponies one year. <laughs> well, let's look at uh, this guy here. This is Carrots the rabbit. He's he's the new the newest friend that Buddy had that Buddy asks in the first book. He's the the first new friend that he makes, and it looks like that he's this picture was in a forest, but it's actually in my neighbor's front yard. <laughs> We got a couple bunnies in my yard this year too. <laughs> this is there was a lot of them, so we just so there was a lot of little rabbits, so we just decided to name them all Carrots the Rabbit. So they're pretty much all p p pictures of him. And what's going on here? Look at this. <laughs> this is at the Metalog Photo Expo. Um, they invited me to do a speaking here. And afterwards, all the uh, speakers got to go get dinner, and they, they called it a finger food dinner, and I asked my dad if we were going to actually eat fingers. <laughs> and did you? <laughs> <laughs> That's a true story. Uh, it was uh, almost two food. years ago when it happened. So. How, was it hard to speak in front of big groups? You seemed um, very comfortable last week when you spoke out here so you've had a you've had some experience yeah I never I'm never really nervous unless I'm talking to people that I've known for a very long time like what? one of my talks last year was to my my school's sixth grade class and my third grade class that was the hardest that was talk, hardest the talk but do you think you had done. an effect do you think you convinced some of them to go out and start shooting their own photographs I don't or at least know. doing something outside? I don't know. That would be their idea if they wanted to do it or not. Are there other things you like to do outside? Oh, yeah. I like to play with my Nerf guns. <laughs> so do my boys, same age. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I like to do laser tag a lot. Horseback. And horseback riding. I, you know, even though we have the latest technology for, like, video games and stuff, you can still, 
if you can still find time to go outside, you still have stuff to play with out there too. You have a lot of stuff. Very much that so. That the younger generation has lost. That's that's a good lesson. That's one we're trying to convey. But I have to say, I think it sounds more effective coming out of your mouth than perhaps uh, your father and I, who are just a couple years older <laughs> than you. What are we looking at here, Carson? Um, this was a talk that I did at my at my new school's campus. Um, a lot of people that I've known for a long time have come that I wouldn't expect would be there, such as my basketball coach from last season. <laughs> Your violin teacher? A violin teacher. Mm -hmm. And the two Banshee Weeks Nature Preserve um, managers. managers. What was nice here, Mark, is that Carson wanted to do the show for the community, mm -hmm. and he donated the proceeds of his book sales back to the school. Oh, which is, I think, our next... Uh, picture here there is you're doing is. a book signing, yeah. right? And uh, I have to stop here and do a plug. <laughs> when you were here last week, we, we sold your book. And then uh, anybody who comes visit NCTC, uh, we have a nice gift shop. And mm -hmm. uh, one of the things we, we highlight is uh, children's books, because a lot of parents come out and want to bring something back for their kids. And we mm -hmm. have um, lots of signed copies of The Adventures of Buddy the Beaver, or they will be signed mm -hmm. in an hour or so <laughs> by you. We'll authenticate the signature. And then uh, hopefully the rest of the books in the series we'll be able to carry mm -hmm. too. How is it to sign your books? Is it you risk it sore um, or anything? <laughs> well, it's kind of fun because you know that you're signing books to people that are that's got to read them to their kids. Mm -hmm. They're going to enjoy them. It just makes me feel good to know that people are going to enjoy my book. And uh, my my manager is my mom. Yeah, that person <laughs> sitting next to you yes. that bears a strong family resemblance, that's <laughs> that's your mother. And uh, you know, is it, do you think your parents have influenced your, your love of the outdoors a little oh, bit? Oh yeah. Ever since I was an infant, my mom and dad took me on hikes in my little, in my little backpack thing that they used to carry me in. I had one of those too. My kids quickly outgrew it mm -hmm. and weight wise. But for those of you that don't know, um, in addition to his uh, photographer and uh, NCTC uh, a trainer father, his, his mother, Jamie Rappaport Clark, was mm -hmm. um, our director of the Fish and Wildlife mm -hmm. Service. So we'd have to say you had good genes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Carson, your name sounds familiar to us. Are, are you named after a conservationist by any chance um, or two? Well, I'm named after. <laughs> Rachel Carson, um, she helped with the reenactment of DDT that was poisoning the eagles. Right. Do you have a middle name that has a uh, um, James and Leopold. <laughs> James comes from my dad's name, well, his original name. And Leopold is from Aldo Leopold, yep. the naturalist. And we've named two lodges out here after you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> or the other way around. It's unclear. But there's a Leopold Lodge and a Carson Lodge. So we got to stay in the Leopold Lodge one night, right? We, already <laughs> did, we did Carson <laughs> Lodge last visit. night. Hopefully when the next edition of, of Buddy your, comes your out. nature you book series, Buddy, comes out, we can mm -hmm. get you back out. Let's look at, what is this picture here? This is a little guy called the Little, is a little Uinta ground squirrel that's found at the Buffalo Ranch World. My mom and my mom, dad, and I do a Yellowstone workshop every year, and they they really just come out to a little squeaky sound, such as ee, and they will pop their head out sometimes, and you can just snap some photographs of them. Did you have to wait a long time to get that one? It looks like. Um, no, because they I guess that's just their call, and they they'll just pop up and. <laughs> By that time, they're trying to store food for the winters, winter, so probably it wouldn't be that hard because they're scurrying around trying to get everything ready. Cool. Let's see what else. You, now, what's going on here? <laughs> this is an uh, abandoned wolf den that the workshop goes every year to. Everybody else was too chicken to even stick their head in there. I was in there the whole time, but in this picture, my dad had to stick his camera all the way in there. He didn't even have... He didn't. He couldn't see me at all. He just took the picture and he got lucky that time. That's great, and that's in the Lamar Valley also. Yeah. <clears throat> what did it smell like in there? I've never been in a wolf den. 
dirt. <laughs> <laughs> we actually couldn't get him out. He wanted to stay in there. That was very comfortable. <laughs> well, this is a good picture to uh, to help explain some of the, the, the equipment you're using. What, what are we looking at here, Carson? Um, well, this was when I was using my dad's big lens and tripod. So, because this was the time when we were photographing these little baby foxes that are going to be our new quick quack crease quackers and quiller, except this time their names are going to be Eeny, Meeny, Miny, Mo, And if that's not enough trouble, there's going to be a little guy named Uh-Oh. I like that. Who thinks up all these names? Me. <laughs> <laughs> I might have guessed that. What are you shooting in this picture? This, like I said, this, this is Larry the Land Snail, and oh. And they move very slow, and he wouldn't come out of his cell. So, again, it took a lot of patience. This, this is the one moment where he started to learn that it took time because he was actually getting a little impatient because it took about 30 <laughs> minutes for the snail to start moving. But then after that, we spent sometimes a couple hours waiting for a certain species, like the kestrel, to come mm -hmm. out of the box. That's very or the impressive, beaver to show up. that type of patience. That at your yeah. age. I don't have that patience at my age, so I'm, I'm quite <laughs> impressed by it. And then sometimes you have to shoot from uh, different perspectives. I think we have a picture here. What are you doing here? This was when I was taking photos of a female kestrel, okay. and if the thing was that she wouldn't come in the box or she wouldn't come out of the box. So it took us a long time because she had to get used to us, and one time when she was coming in, and and we we thought she was gonna land, but we never know. We started taking the pictures, and the flash from our cameras scares her away, so she flew off. But she got used to it, mm -hmm. didn't she? But it would. I think the longest he waited for one shot was three hours. Wow. Does it ever make you want to take pictures of animals that are just more common? <laughs> um. <laughs> make his friend be a mosquito or something. Well, <laughs> usually. <laughs> Because Kestrel is extremely difficult. Raptors mm -hmm. are very, very shy, as, as you know. Well, I like taking pictures of common animals, but I also want to go to Africa sometime to go on a safari and take some photographs there. And you've met a number of famous photographers. Mm -hmm. they, uh, I know I saw a picture of you with, uh, oh, jeez, <laughs> who's this? Um, you may not remember. That's Bill Fortney from Nikon. He's a very famous okay. photographer, but he's a Nikon uh, individual, works for Nikon. And uh, probably going to be sponsoring Carson before too long, I'm sure. So no surprise. But there's there. a couple of other images of some yeah, very well-known photographers. We I, we saw one the other night with Art Wolf, and I know he's yeah. gone around the world. Joe Satori, who's and who's the fellow from Sweden? You got uh, Mr. Stefan Winstrand. And he actually got to introduce them. Uh, one of his speaking engagements was back in February. He was the keynote speaker at the opening session of the North American Nature Photography wow. Association. I got to skip a week of school. Is that a picture? That's it that? right there. Oh, okay. yeah. Look at you. Yeah, 450 people at least in the audience. And these are photographers from around the world, some of the, the world's best that, that are there. And they were totally, totally surprised and uh, very happy to see Carson there and speak. Do the older photographers give you a lot of advice? Um. Not much because <laughs> trade secrets. I already have one of an old. <laughs> I forgot you do have an old photographer. You can you can query. <sighs> Who are you shaking hands with in this? Um, that's me shaking hands with Mr. Joel Sartori. The okay. uh, this is the last. He was the last speaker, and I I gave him one of my books. And so. Who does he work for? And he works for National Geographic. And he had, it was actually with with. Uh, Jamie down at the golf photographing wow. the, the, the oil spill, oil spill with Jamie. Money. But Carson actually got to introduce him at the, he was an MC also of the conference. So Have you wanted to, to go down him. and film the oil spill? That's big news these days. Um, well, it, I just don't want to see these animals covered in oil, but if I do go down there, there I'll probably help speed up the act because, you know, it's all these grown-ups going down there, so it might be better to get a a kid's perspective of what it looks like and how it feels down there. Makes sense. And so he may he may be going down to be a kid reporter for I think his that'd mom. be great. That'd be super. Who are you with in this next picture? Um, that's Mr. Stefan Winstrand, um, the guy from Sweden. He takes a lot of 
wild photographs. And he's uh, an outstanding nature photographer. I think he was actually the European Photographer of the Year a wow. couple of times. And he actually came up to seek out Carson and talk to him at this conference. What a great experience. Let's see who we have next. To the oh. oh, now this is different. This is oh. back in the North America here. This is, um, this is in Yellowstone National Park. It's a little hot spring, and each color in there represents a different kind of algae or bacteria that scientists are figuring out that will cure many kinds of, many kinds of diseases that we have today. That is a beautiful photograph. I really like that. Let's see what the next one is. This is another hot spring. That's they're all just different kinds of colors. That's it's what it, that's what attracts me to them because there's just so many different kinds of colors that that's there. So I just like to go to different hot springs and look to see what they what color they are. I think the next photograph might show you taking one of these pictures. Oh, nope. <laughs> That's further in the thing. That probably is not a hot spring, I'm guessing. No. <laughs> this is this is Quick Quack Quees, Quackers and Quiller, the Mallards. This is when Bunny passes them by and in this one page it says their names about six times. It's real, uh, that's my favorite page of the book. Do you remember where you photographed that? Yeah, Blackwater. Mm -hmm. National Wildlife. Another National Wildlife Refuge. Yeah, beautiful location. Now this is a familiar looking character, the Department of Interior symbol here. What? This is a uh, male bison. We took we took all these pictures from the safety of the car because it was running season. So if they saw you standing there, they would probably. And if you like threatened them or did something dumb or stupid, they would charge. And like we saw. These people put this little girl not more than 15 feet away from a bull bison that was standing right next to a cow. That's nuts. Why, if we go back to that previous one, why is he sticking his tongue out at you? I don't know. <laughs> that was just so. He's swimming, right? He's swimming. He's, he's, uh, he's tasting the air to mm -hmm. see where the females are, mm -hmm. right? They do that a lot. So, yeah. We have another nice shot you took of a bison. Um, again, taken from the safety of my car because I don't want to really go stand next to them and <laughs> tell them to sit and stay like a dog <laughs> would because still it's running season. So I just zoomed in on his eye and took the picture. How do you get the animals, now for bison you're staying in the car and so on, for yes. other animals, how do you get them not to be afraid of you? Are you standing really still or are you camouflaged um, a little bit or? Shooting from a distance? Uh, mostly shooting from a distance, mm -hmm. but for the pika, we usually just have to stand still or they will get used to us after days of work. We actually spent four consecutive mornings just photographing pika wow. in Yellowstone. While, while everybody's trying to get the megafauna, yeah. we were just intent on documenting what's happening to the pikas, right. and he, he fell in love with pikas. So we would sit there with Jamie Mom would be there with us, and we'd sit there for about four hours. And as the day warmed up, the morning warmed up, the pikas became very active. Where they were getting as close as they, this camera, That's is great. to us. So, and do you want to just tell us in a sentence or two what's happening to the pikas? There? I'll let Carson tell it. Well, because of global warming, they're getting pushed up higher into the mountain, up higher to the mountain peak, <clears> which <throat> is bad because they can only live at a certain temperature. So. Once they reach the top, that's the end. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're becoming iconic species for global climate mm -hmm. change. What are we looking at here? We got some. This is one of my favorite shots he's ever taken. Um, this was at Sincatique National Wildlife Refuge. It was during the migration of the snow geese. Um, it was just that it was at late evening when the sun was setting, and it just turned the birds to a black shadow and that was the best time to get them because it would be dinner time by that time so they would they would fly up in large flocks with I which I think there's one picture of them here that shows that. Yeah, a couple thousand. Your dad said this was one of his favorite pictures. Do you have a particular favorite picture? Um his? yes it's of a pika. He's, <laughs> he's just No surprise there. No. 
I think we have some pikas. We may yeah. we may flip through the slideshow. Let's show. You might this look one at this though. one. This, this is an interesting nice. one. He just took this one a few weeks ago. This is Gary the Great Tree Frog. He's he we had a lot of time getting him to to work out with us, and we we suspect he would be saying right now, "Can I have a little help here?" <laughs> because he's hanging <laughs> like from because he's, he's just hanging from one little strand of grass. And he'll be a character for the new book, Excellent. Mystery of the Missing Friends. Well, let's run through a few more slides. Now, oh, what do we got here? This is a great blue heron that was also taken with my brand new Nikon D90 camera at Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge. And the bad part about that day was that it was freezing us out. But luckily, we had the Beatles music to warm us up. <laughs> <laughs> Very good taste in music. Mm -hmm. I think we're going back to mammals with the next one here. This is... Uh, this is... We're going to name him Stubby the Groundhog because of how how stubby his little feet are. But this was when we were in Canaan Valley mm -hmm. in West Virginia when we were heading down to the secret location of the beaver. Don't give too much away. <laughs> Canaan Valley is a beautiful... <coughs> Local wildlife refuge. Yeah, we've been there a lot too. Yeah. Let's go to a few more images before we run out of time. What are we there? These are frozen bubbles. These are bubbles that have been frozen under a lake during the winter time, and I and I sent my dad out first to see if <laughs> it would be it safe. <laughs> I'm glad I'm useful for something yeah. with him. <laughs> the canary in a coal mine. He figured figured if the ice tailed me, he could go out there. I think we have a picture of you on a stream side coming up here, or maybe by a pond. Well, no. this was at the Beaver Pond in Banshee Reeks uh, Nature Preserve, a little place close to our house. This was when I was checking to see if the lodge was active or not. We only got a picture of one of the beavers that lived there, but uh, soon after there was a really, very big storm that just, we think, swept them away to another uh, place. That's where we actually got the idea for Buddy the Beaver, was watching this beaver pond. And so I told Carson, before we photograph, you've got to learn about the beaver. So yeah. not only did he read, but he also, and his, his school helped him learn about the beaver, the park manager sending books. Then he had to actually go out and explore a beaver pond to learn what it was like. And they gave him this equipment to go up onto the lodge and see if he could hear the young ones. Oh, that's great. So he learned a lot before he actually took one single picture of the beaver. Hey, we're running out of time, but I think <clears throat> um, either the slide before or after this has some pretty uh, important significance. Can we go back one slide? No, forward one slide. Forward one slide off of this. Yeah. Let's punch this one up. This is yeah. this is a good one to go out on because it's, it's beautiful. <laughs> Tell us about this. Well, this was the one that I was talking about earlier that that I was the youngest winner of the the contest. This was the monarch butterfly in flight at Banshee Reeks Nature Preserve. It, that was the day that I just wanted to go outside and have some fun with my camera. And I went over to ask my dad if it was a good picture or not, and he said it was an incredible shot, so he did something with it, and it happened. In fact, he, w he had just turned six. It looks like I, an impressionist painting. Well, I mean, when I saw the picture, I said, you know, this is what we're missing in life. It's mm -hmm. just to go out and have fun. And just about anything you do, if you have a passion and a joy for it, it, it makes it a lot easier. And so what I do with that picture on my programs around the country, I show this and say, you need to go back to this, to being a kid. Yeah. You know, have that childlike curiosity and always have a smile on your face when you're out there photographing. And it's not the photograph, it's the experience, experience. that counts. That's a good one to go out on. Carson, those are beautiful photographs you. you took. And your book is enormously entertaining. I think all kids would like it. And once again, it's called Buddy the Beaver Adventures mm -hmm. in the Pond. It's called The Adventures of Buddy the Beaver, Buddy Explores This Pond. Yeah, here we have punched it up again. Mm -hmm. uh, we look forward to uh, sequels mm -hmm. and, and movies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you have to get a TV series. Yeah, yeah. maybe a TV series on Animal Planet or one of these would be a great idea. Mm -hmm. We look forward to seeing many more award-winning photographs from you, Carson, mm -hmm. and we hope you can come back to NCTC sometime and share with us. So thank it. you very much, and we'll thank your dad for driving you out here. You're more than welcome. <laughs> Inspiring Anytime. his love 
for nature and photography. Yeah, thank and you. Uh, Carson, this was really fun. You are the youngest person we've ever done a distance broadcast with. So this is another first to, to add to your, your many mm -hmm. accolades. All right. Well, all thank, right. And thank I want to thank all of you for tuning in and uh, learning uh, a little about our uh, youngest and uh, uh, nature photographer I'm sure you're going to hear much uh, from in the upcoming years. So thanks again, Carson and Jim. Appreciate oh, you're it. welcome. Welcome. welcome.